The year was 1938, and international diamond cartel De Beers had a problem. With the back-to-back impact of the First World War and the Great Depression, diamond prices in the United States were starting to collapse. Along with falling prices, market research showed that the diamond engagement rings were falling out of favor with the younger generation. De Beers contracted N.W.A. Aaron Son to create an ad campaign that would come to be one of the most recognized of all time. N.W.A. carried out the campaign with military precision. The first prong of their attack came in 1939 when they introduced the four C's to the public. Comprised of cut, color, clarity, and carat weight, the four C's were intended to educate the public about diamonds. Next came the celebrities. By putting diamonds on the hands of celebrities and tying the diamonds to romance, Ayer put out continuous press releases to major newspapers in America. After the celebrities came the high schoolers. Ayer had a crack team of lecturers traveling around the country to high schools explaining the virtues of the diamond engagement ring. By linking these talks back to the celebrities and their rings, thousands of girls were reached in the 1940s. In 1948, N.W.A.R. copywriter Francis Garrity came up with a slogan that would eventually take over the industry, A Diamond is Forever. Seeking to convince the public that an engagement ring is indispensable and a diamond is the only acceptable stone for an engagement ring, this campaign took off. But N.W.A. and Son weren't done yet. You see, when a couple shops for an engagement ring together, they tend to be frugal and spend less money. So they encouraged the idea of the surprise engagement. They even gave some help to all the clueless fellows out there by telling them how much they should spend. And it's quite simple. If you were in the United States, two months' salary was your target. If you were in the United Kingdom, one month would do. Sadly, if you were in Japan, three months should have been your goal. De Beers and Ayer invented these numbers quite simply because they could. In 1999, A Diamond is Forever was crowned the slogan of the century by the Advertising Age newspaper. That may have helped fuel the $70 billion worldwide engagement ring market. But where did the idea of wearing a piece of metal around the finger to signify marriage come from? Join us today as we take a look at the history behind the engagement ring. Our story starts more than 2,000 years ago in ancient Rome, where the engagement ring was born. There were, of course, earlier examples of rings found in Egyptian tombs, with the ruling class wearing larger, heavy gold rings engraved with their names and titles, and the less wealthy making do with other materials, such as silver, glass, or pottery covered in blue dye. These, however, were more general-purpose rings, only rarely being signified for marriage. It isn't until around 200 BC that the actual engagement ring comes into its own in ancient Rome. Women in ancient Rome would wear an engagement ring for two reasons, either to signify a business contract, which some marriages were back then, or to show love and obedience to their husbands. Although the ring started out simple, being made of ivory, bone, flint, and bronze, by the 2nd century BC, gold had become the primary choice for an engagement ring. This was often to denote the man's ability to afford to have a family. During the next several centuries in Rome, it became common for women to have two rings, one made of gold for being in public and one made of iron for work around the house. Fast forward a few hundred years to the 7th century, and the Roman Empire is gone. We are in southern Spain and France now with the Visigoths, an early Germanic people that was part of a political group that helped bring about the end of the Holy Roman Empire. They maintained a kingdom consisting of most of modern-day Portugal and Spain to the south of France and into northern Italy. It was there that King Chindasawinth created the Lex Visigothorum, or the Visigothic Code. Created in 642 and later expanded by his son King Resiswinth in 654, it was a code of laws that was the first of its kind. It applied laws equally not only to the conquering Goths, but also the population they conquered, which had been living Roman lives under Roman law. Specific to our story, the law of marriage was spelled out. The code stated that, quote, that when the ceremony of betrothal has been performed, and the ring shall have been given or accepted as a pledge, although nothing may have been committed in writing, the promise shall, under no circumstances, be broken. End quote. As we pass through history, the use of a ring as an indicator of marriage was more strongly cemented in the public consciousness. In 860 AD, Pope Nicholas I wrote a letter to the ruler of the First Bulgarian Empire, Boris I of Bulgaria that in the Roman Catholic Church, a man would give his betrothed an engagement ring to signify his intentions. 
In 1215, Pope Innocent III convened the Fourth Council of the Lateran, essentially a meeting of the clergy for the Roman Catholic Church. As part of his declaration, the Church outlawed clandestine marriages, requiring all marriages to be made public in advance. Along with the publishing of this information, one of the indicators of intending marriage in public was an engagement ring. We'll step forward now into the 15th century, where we meet up with a young Maximilian I, better known to history as Archduke Maximilian of Austria. Born on March 22, 1459 in Weiner Neustadt, Austria, to Frederick III, the Holy Roman Empire of the House of Habsburg, Frederick created an empire that stretched from the Netherlands to Italy and Spain to Poland. He would eventually share a co-rulership with his son Maximilian. A few years earlier and several hundred miles north, Mary of Burgundy was born in Brussels. Her father, Charles the Bold, was a ruler of a vast and wealthy collection of lands. As he had no sons when she was born, she became heir apparent to her father. As a result, poor Mary had a steady stream of suitors all trying to win her hand in marriage. The first marriage request came when she was just five years old to take the hand of future King Ferdinand II of Aragon. Later, it was Charles, the Duke of Berry. And then, even though he was 13 years younger than Mary, it was Charles's nephew, the future King Charles VIII of France. Next in line was Nicholas I, the Duke of Lorraine, who died suddenly in 1473. George Plantagenet, the Duke of Clarence, was up next. He might have had a chance if not for his brother, the King of England, Edward IV, shutting him down. You see, Edward was trying to win support for his brother-in-law, Anthony Woodville, when he tried to propose to Mary. Confused yet? Mary spent most of her time fending off suitors until her father was defeated and killed in battle in 1477. Realizing she had to marry someone to secure the future of her lands, she turned to our friend Maximilian. Although the marriage was typical for the ruling class at the time, it was made for convenience and power instead of love, it relates to our story in one very important way. Maximilian gave Mary an engagement ring set with a diamond. This is the first recorded instance of a ring for marriage being set with a diamond. Although not recorded to history, it is certain the people were giving each other diamond rings before this. But these being royals, no different from our current day, people took notice, especially other wealthy people. The current fad in Europe at the time was an engagement ring that was solid gold. But because of the ring that Maximilian gave Mary, everyone with money started using diamonds in their engagement ring. As we move into the 17th and 18th century in Europe, gimel rings became a popular way to propose. The name Gimel comes from the Latin word gemellus, meaning twin. The rings were two or three rings that were actually fashioned to fit together to form one complete ring. The engaged couple would each wear one of the links and then rejoin them during the ceremony to form the wedding ring. In the case of the three-ring design, the third ring was used for the person that could witness the couple's vows and return the third portion of the ring to them on the wedding day. Also popular during this time was the posy ring, a gold band which was engraved with a poem, usually from popular works of the day. These rings, however, tended to be given as a gift of endearment instead of an engagement ring. It was around this time that the idea of wearing the ring on the third finger of your left hand was popularized. Henry Swinburne was a scholar and English ecclesiastical lawyer best known for his legal treatises. He was working on a treatises of spousal or matrimonial contracts up to his death in 1624. Published when a draft was found in 1688, it details wearing the ring on the third finger of the left hand, as that finger contained the vena amoris, or heart vein, a vein that was believed to travel directly to the heart. Until the mid-19th century, elaborate engagement rings remained the realm of the wealthy, with the lower class settling on plain gold or silver bands for the wedding. This all changed in 1852 when the Koh-i-Noor diamond was recut for Queen Victoria. The Koh-i-Noor is arguably the most famous diamond in the world. Originally from India, the earliest recorded weight of the stone was 186 carats, making it one of the largest ever discovered. The English obtained the stone from India when the last Treaty of Lahore was signed, ceding the stone to Queen Victoria. Although large and faceted, the stone was not considered particularly brilliant, with disappointment in the appearance not being uncommon. With the consent of the government of England, Prince Albert decided to have the stone polished for Queen Victoria. Employing one of the best artisans at the time, Levi Benjamin Vorsanger, the cutting took place over 38 days. Prince Albert and the Duke of Wellington supervised with the Queen's mineralogist James Tennant being the technical supervisor. Using a steam-powered mill specifically constructed for the job, Prince Albert paid £8,000, which is the equivalent of $1.5 million today to have the stone cut. 
When completed, the stone went from 186 carats to its current 105.6 carats due to Mr. Vorsanger finding several flaws that he had to cut out. Cut in a modified brilliant round cut, the stone was lighter but much more dazzling. It eventually made its way into the crown jewels where it remains to this day. Upon the release of the story to the public, a worldwide diamond rush began. Although smaller mines were discovered, it wasn't until diamonds were found in South Africa that the diamond industry took off. The first mines were opened in 1867, with the production in 1872 reaching more than 1 million carats per year. This influx of diamonds into the market meant for the first time diamond engagement rings were not just for the wealthy. The popularity of diamond engagement rings in the United States grew until the early part of the 20th century when the diamond market collapsed. Before World War II, less than 10% of couples in the United States had a diamond engagement ring. This could have been the end for the diamond and wedding jewelry if not for De Beers. As we learned about in the start of this episode, De Beers, founded in 1888 by Cecil Rhodes, used their position and ingenious ad campaign to single-handedly convince the world they needed a diamond in their engagement ring. Up until the early 21st century, they had a monopoly on the diamond industry, with an estimated 85% of rough diamond content being controlled by them. Combine that monopoly with the use of their ad campaigns, and the sales of diamonds in the United States skyrocketed from $23 million in 1939 to over $2.1 billion in 1979. Today, more than 75% of American brides have a diamond in their engagement ring. The 21st century has brought other changes, aside from seeing De Beers lose their diamond monopoly. Technology has revolutionized the way that people shop for, buy, and make engagement rings. From lab-created stones to 3D-printed ring designs and online shopping experience, the engagement ring market continues to evolve. While diamonds are still popular today in engagement ring, the choices are endless. From halos to vintage rings to colorful gemstones and general neutral rings and simple bands, there's a style out there for everyone. A diamond might be forever, but so are these three facts about the engagement ring. December is the most popular month to purchase an engagement ring, with approximately 15% of couples getting engaged on Christmas. Around 2,000 couples get engaged a year at Disney World. The Statue of Liberty is another popular choice, with around 100 couples taking the ferry to get engaged there. Studies have shown that only 35% of engagement rings are purchased without the fiancé's knowledge, with 28% of women saying that they would turn down the proposal if they didn't like the ring. Thank you for listening to this episode of The History Behind. I'm your host, Eli Webb. Please be sure to like and follow wherever you listen to podcasts. Join us next time when we discover the history behind coffee.